So here I have on a desktop uh, a folder, a Mamone folder, uh, for the motion painting that you saw earlier. And um, you can see that I have a lot of different elements in this folder. And what I want to focus on in this segment of the video is the process of um, assembling footage and layering in After Effects. So uh, as you can see here, I have uh, uh, seven uh, After Effects projects. I had originally called the uh, motion painting patch of light portrait. So and I later changed it to Mamonet. But <clears throat> and I don't want to play all of these for you, but I do want to focus on three or four of them just to give you a little bit of uh, uh, insight, hopefully, into how uh, I work with all of these elements. So I'm going to open uh, the third project. These were created probably over a six week period. And um, I usually create the project, do some work with it. And then if I'm not happy with the result and I feel that I've reached a dead end, I go on and create a new project. Sometimes I incorporate uh, elements from the previous project in, and uh, copy and paste them into the new project. Usually I do that, but not always. So here is the um, third patch of light portrait, which as I mentioned, I changed to Mamonet uh, <clears throat> when it was nearly done. So in this uh, After Effects project here, I'm working, by the way, with uh, After Effects the CS 5.5. And as I mentioned, I think I mentioned somewhere, I'm not going to go into a how to uh, do work in After Effects. What I want to do is just to give you a sense of my thinking and what I felt was interesting, how I combined these various elements into layers and why I did it, if I can remember how I did it or why I did it, uh, and then uh, move on to the next project. If you look on the left of the screen here, you'll see that I've brought in I don't know, two dozen or so elements into this project here. Also, if you look into the um, After Effects uh, comp window here, and uh, you'll see that I've got a patch of light, larger squiggles and pre comp So let's take a look at some of these here. I'm going to start with the um, squiggles, which are the little processing uh, glitches, effects, little en bits of energy that float around that I wanted to use. Somehow I felt that I needed to incorporate that into the motion painting. And so if you look at this here, you'll see that in the uh, pre-comp window, I have assembled uh, eight of the processing squiggles. The original processing squiggle here is a QuickTime movie. Uh, it was created in processing. Um, it's a duration of uh, 1 minute 49 seconds and 42 frames. That's not possible. It is, well, maybe it is. Um, okay. Right. Boy, it can't be 42. Well, let's, let me see. Why is it 42 frames? Frames per second. Oh, it's 60 frames per second. That's why. Okay. You'll see, um, those of you who are video savvy or film savvy, uh, that um, you can work at a different frame rate. And I often combine different frame rates together on one project and let the computer tell me how it wants to treat it. But in this case, the processing squiggles uh, were done at 60 frames per second. Uh, OK, so let's take a look here. If I open up the effects folder, I have enabled the color key, which is black, because when I created the processing movie, it had a black background, and it brought it in not as an alpha layer, but as a black background. So I want to get rid of the black background so I can see through it. And uh, if I um, deselect the color key, now the black is superimposed on top of the of the red. So that's not what I want. All right. So I, I don't want to belabor this this point here, but 
what I've done essentially is to duplicate or triplicate these uh, squiggles, offset them in time so that they play a little bit differently. And I felt that the, um, the amount of uh, little glitches that were happening were too few with one of them only. So I uh, created superimposed three on, on top of each other. And now you've got more going on than if you did with just one. This is only one and this is all three superimposed on top. Also, I uh, changed the color by going into uh, one of the filters, one of the effects in, in After Effects called Colorama and uh, it allows me to change the color. And <clears throat> if I select it, you'll see what I mean here. You can see that the bottom layer here, this is layer number eight, maybe it'll be a little more visible if I do this and um, make it a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna go back to whatever color I had, I think it was a red. Anyway, it's not important at this point. Okay, so much for the squiggles. So this version here, which is the third that I worked on, has um, various elements in here. If you take a look, I've got uh, 12 elements and I'm gonna deselect all of them except the bottom one. So on the bottom, you've got the um, movie that I had made that I mentioned earlier in iPad and uh, of my house and discolored that. So that movie is going on, but because it was short and it had different elements in it, I uh, repeated it and you can see here that I've repeated it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times. So to make it last the length of the composition, which now is close to 10 minutes. So again, these are superimpositions, but they are the background. Um, the scale also has changed. It doesn't make any difference to me because this is really an element that ultimately uh, is um, on the periphery of the work. And um, so I'm gonna move on here and show you this layer number five here has a mask on it. If I deselect the mask, it's full frame, but if I en enable it again, I created a mask uh, that has a kind of an oval shape to fit around my, my uh, face. And um, if I invert it, for example, you see it just, it's just a hole, okay. Um, because this layer is, allows only visibility transparency on the periphery, more on the right here than it does on the left, when I enable all of these uh, movies that I've repeated here, you'll see that they are now on the right side. And this is closer to what I felt would be interesting. I was gonna say what I had in mind, I'm not sure that I had anything in mind, but I did want some kind of disturbance on the left and on the right. So this is um, the way this, this one uh, turned out. I do wanna add the squiggles. Now you see that the color is green if I move the timeline here, this is, this number three actually turned out to be quite a bit closer to the final result that I had. Um, I had patch of light duplicated on top here for layer number one, but it, it uh, takes away from some of the interesting stuff going on in the background. It's subtle, but you can see on the top, for example, that if I enable that layer, it gets rid of some, I think, interesting stuff going on. So uh, I decided to disable that layer. I kept it in, but I'm not using it. I want to go back now 
um, to show you the After Effects project which modified what you have seen in uh, the third project in a way that I thought might be interesting, although ultimately I ended up discarding it. But uh, you'll see in a second here when this boots up, shows up, loads as they say, that um, what was interesting to me here was um, this here. Uh, so what I did is I took um, this basic number three movie, uh, copied it and pasted it in here, and then I played around with with bringing other elements in. So um, you can see that this one was used three times in the project. This one was used two times. This one was used three times. This one was not used at all. I'm going to go on to uh, a file called Flickneck 3, which is a painting that I, um, you've seen, I think, before that I did in iPad. Um, squiggles, you've seen. These are all various layers that I brought in from the iPad that I thought might be interesting. Uh, I think actually they look better separated than they do combined. So um, there's, a, there's an abstract element about these that pleases me that uh, maybe at some level will uh, suggest that I do something with them, but at this point uh, I don't think I use them. This is the one of the layers uh, that I did in iPad that I ended up not using. Another one slightly different and this one as well. And this one of course is number three. Uh, this one we've seen I think before. But the point that I want to get to is have that um, if I deselect these layers, you'll see that one of the layers that we saw was over, I moved it to the right to create the triptych. This second or eighth layer was moved to the left. And this middle layer, patch of light, larger TN tint is in the middle. And then I added, uh, I thought I might add uh, the iPad drawing of, on the side of the lake that I had done, but let's take a look at it. And I think maybe looking back on this, it would have been more interesting to break these up as I have into their various elements and just select a few of them. And let's say, for example, that I had selected Not this. Well, let's say just for the heck of it. Okay. That might have been more interesting. Anyway, I decided not to use it. Uh, flick neck I brought in, but I didn't want to cover it. It's actually a fairly large sized uh, image. So you can see that I've effected it a little bit in a filter called Blobalize, um, which gives you kind of like it breaks up the image makes it kind of like wavy and gooey. It's blobby. And um, you've got different possibilities here. I don't know if you can see if it makes any difference if I deselect that, that effect. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. So um, I also made it uh, quite a bit smaller in scale than moved it. And I thought, of course, that the repetition of the images, even though these portraits are different one from the other, um, they are too systemic. And so I thought that maybe uh, 
these two elements would break it up a little bit and make it more interesting. Ultimately, I discarded all of these triptychs anyway. But, okay, so this is the, um, okay, this is the layer that we saw er earlier. I don't know if I did show you this. This is 2014, 11, 3, 22, 35. 3, 22, 35, so it's effectively this one. But you see, when I brought it into the composition, I'll go back to it and click on it. By the way, when you click on that layer in a composition, it'll go to the, it'll go to the layer itself. You can see that I've effected that in, in a way. Um, I created a mask. If I deselect it, you'll see that you can see the whole thing. So I just wanted that small segment or that thin, narrow segment of the image. Um, as opposed to the opposite. Also, uh, I wanted to feather what's called feathering so that the, the borders are um, indeterminate on the mask. And um, I rotated it. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, I rotated it 90 degrees. What I find, you know, it's interesting, uh, the notion of uh, duplication or replication um, obviously, um, in um, what we look at, as a rule, most of the time, uh, we don't repeat um, cookie cutter stuff. You know, you may look at a, at a development with cookie cutter uh, houses uh, built on it. Uh, or, and uh, so there is some duplication going on, but, but in nature, um, most of the time, nothing is ever repeated exactly the way it is, uh, temporarily or uh, spatially. Um, so what happens, uh, I think, when you duplicate or replicate, or you make diptychs or triptychs, you effectively suggest to the viewer that you're not copying reality, you're changing, modifying it, or creating a new animal. Um, and um, it abstracts it from a quotidian reality from our normal, usual, customary reality. And to the extent that it does that, I think it's interesting because it adds a fresh perspective on what we look at and, and on our reaction and to what we see. Um, one of the things, if I can find it here, is, uh, and I don't have but one of the things that I wanted to just touch on very briefly is uh, that because of the computer's ability, of course, when you work at digital media, how do you consider the notion of uh, originality? Does originality mean anything anymore? If you can take an image and duplicate it and duplicate it and duplicate it ad infinitum, now maybe you, in, in point of fact, you can't do it ad infinitum, but essentially many, many times over, which one's the original one? So the notion of originality, uniqueness in, in a sense of originality seems to disappear in a digital world. Unless you claim that the first one you make is in fact the original and all the others that look exactly the same uh, are, are um, not originals. But I, I would argue that that's, that's a little bit um, uh, perverse, <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> perverse because you may want to hold on to the uh, idea of originality, but, that, but that's not what it means. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, as I mentioned, I ended up discarding this, and I want to show you one more, but I did make a movie out of it, and the movie out of it is this one here. And uh, I'll shrink the timeline or zoom out of the timeline and you'll see <clears throat> that the composition is uh, 9 minutes, 12 seconds, and 16 frames. Um, but the basic composition is this layer here, layer number 2, and this composition here is layer number 2 shrunk down to a speed of um, 
I shrunk down to um, be, let's see, what is it? 5%, I think. Anyway, it's, it's speeded up so that it is now 5% of itself. Okay, so it was, I, what I did, just if you're interested, I'll go back to this here for a second. Um, I took this layer, made a movie out of it, and brought it in, and then went into layer time, and I, re I stretched it to be 5% of its size, and then I reversed it. And so this time remapping, it's called. And so this is an effect, the same layer going backwards, so that when I'm at the end of that layer, I'm effectively, which takes place in a fraction of the time that it did to play the original, you'll see that there's no change in visual information. Okay, enough with this number four. And I'm going to go on to open number six. I thought, okay, the triptych is not particularly interesting. There's something stale about it. Well, let me see if I can make it even worse. <laughs> okay, sometimes you've got to make it worse to make it better. Okay, often you have to make it worse to make it better. Or... Um, not irrelevant. If you make it irrelevant, you discard it, but just make it worse. Okay, so you see here that my, uh, let me go back and see what compositions. So some of these compositions carried over. This one we've seen was number three. These are the squiggles. I'm getting sick and tired of the squiggles here. Uh, okay, so this, this one here is kind of interesting because what happened is that I took the original triptych, brought it in, and then changed it, modified it in some ways in terms of the colors here. Um, so I went through a lot of different effects here in After Effects to change what this looks like to what this looks like here in the middle. They're the same thing. This is the original layer and then after the effects are filtered in on this, you've got a fairly radical shift in colors. Um, I thought maybe that would be more interesting. I don't know. I did the same thing. Um, black. Okay, so that one. I did the same thing here. Let's take a look at the original. This is the original. Um, one of the originals that was done in the iPad. And um, I added the filters in that as well. Effects, channels, hue, saturation, gamma, pedestal gain, tint, all of these. If I go back to the composition, you'll see how they changed. So set channels, modified it to be more little sepia. This one, again, more sepia, hue, saturation. Uh, this one is subtle, but... It just take, took away a little of the black, and then this one, of course, is the uh, tint, uh, which, when it's combined with these other three effects, gives you this change in the, in the image. So this is the mask here, and I don't think I did, you know, well, I did hue saturation. It's so subtle you can't even see the difference. I mean, maybe it's there. But you can see that uh, the mask is important because if it's none, it'll be superimposed over the, the uh, portrait on the left. And also you won't have the uh, gradation between that layer and the um, image, which I wanted to have. This uh, Flick Neck 3 JPEG uh, was modified in Blobalize and uh, just so, you know, I didn't like the way that looked very much. Um, and so I modified it. I uh, also added tint 
because that was too jarring with uh, the rest of the colors here. I didn't think it, it would fit really. Um, I um, exported these individually instead of making a triptych out of it. And then I ended up by duplicating the uh, original triptych, placing it on top with the modified uh, colors and seeing if that was any more satisfactory. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting anyway. Um, I mean, I'm not sure um, if it doesn't really work. I'm not sure. I think the only way I could find out if it works is to uh, make a movie out of it and then project it on a, on a huge wall because uh, I think the size does make a difference and it's not nearly as interesting as I think it might be. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, go fit. So yeah, that's a little more interesting. Um, but I don't know, I ended up discarding that as well. All right, moving on here, I want to go to the last one here and show you the project that I used to create the final uh, motion painting that we saw earlier in, in uh, video one and two, <clears throat> the Bamboo motion painting. Come on, you can do it, you can load. 23 second, 1911. Didn't have time for my cup of coffee, okay. By the way, the uh, workspace here is a little bit different. I organized it so that you would have the composition, uh, which is the final result on the right side, and the image on the left represents the actual layer. So <clears throat> if I click on any one of these layers, you'll see that I'm getting different information on the left. So, um, I'm going to work by deselecting this and you'll see that this second, well, I think let's start with the bottom here. This layer is, you may remember if you saw the other video, that I decided to use a still image of uh, oil paint. And, you know, there's something about the viscosity of oil paint, the texture, the way it looks that in a way I can't duplicate no matter what with any of the computer softwares. Uh, maybe they, they do exist, but um, this was on my uh, uh, palette, literally on a, on a huge piece of glass that I used to uh, mix oil paints and I thought it looked pretty good. I did a whole bunch of them. I don't know if I can show you, maybe, oh, yeah, here they are. Um, so I just took various stills and thought maybe I could incorporate that in some way into, this is the one that I actually ended up using, but maybe this was, would have been fun as well. But you can see the texture and the, the feel of this is totally unique and um, you can't really duplicate this in a computer. You can take a picture of it and arrive at a facsimile that's not too bad but look at look at this for example all, in, all the dust and all the you know the wonderful stuff going on here um, you know that may be a uh, painting in and of itself sort of okay view I was gonna blow it up but no I don't have to anyway I'm gonna go back to the uh, after effects uh, just a few more because they're really nice to look at but, okay, After Effects composition. So this is the paint that I ended up using as a background. Now I'm gonna enable these other three layers. This is actually the finished result here. I mean, I've got a lot of this composition, for example, you may remember I talked about an old painting that I did in 1972 plus, uh, a drawing that I had done about the same time, line drawing, and then uh, Wesselman, um, and I thought maybe I would make some kind of 
use that as some basis uh, for uh, motion painting, but I ended up discarding it. So let me back up a little bit before I was going to go on to something else here. I'm going to back up to... Um, <clears throat> okay, this one is called After Money Money 3. So again, a name change. Okay, After Money Money 3. Let's, let's go to the uh, layer itself. After Money Money 3 is this one which is an iteration of the self-portrait that I thought might be interesting. Um, I, you know, stayed with it for a couple of days and decided maybe it's not as interesting as I thought it was. So, but I did end up using it and yet modifying it through um, a mask again. So that's the mask. I inverted it just so you see where it is. Uh, and the mask is... Uh, changed in color. It's hard to see, but when I change that, you see that this layer is a little bit to the right of that. And in the middle, and changes it. So these are actually the mask here is here, okay, in this vertical strip here. And these are all different color keys. I keyed out a great deal of it. If I deselect these color keys, you'll see that it's uh, uh, opaque. But I didn't want that totally opaque. I wanted some of the background to be seen. So I did end up using this uh, flash animation. And uh, Let's see if we can spot where it, it was. I ended up keying it, so I didn't want the white background, of course. So it's, I placed it on the left side again. I wanted some kind of disturbance on the left of my, of my portrait and my face. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that I keyed out the white background. I was left with the, with the black. And then um, I changed the opacity from 100 so it's in the background, you can see it, to 30, because I did not want to drown out uh, the background behind that. Um, and I thought the, the, the color, the subtle color would be more interesting. Uh, this is another layer that I ended up using. If I deselect it, this layer, I don't know if you can see this, but it's on the left side here. And it has a mask. I'll get rid of it. So you'll see what it is. I'll make it clear if I show you the layer itself, which as you see, um, underwent a couple of changes. Uh, the rotation uh, is 97 degrees now. So, you see how it's changed it in the composition. I'm going to go back to 97. And um, it's stretched out, so the shape of it is different. And uh, I made it, instead of uh, red on a transparent background, I made it black and white. So I went through these black and white effects here to change it. Now it's red. If I deselect it, now it's black and white. Why I did that, I don't know. But, you know, I try to experiment, explore things, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Um, so this one has This is without the white background, so it looks quite different. You notice, I think maybe the, the important or interesting thing about this is that everything that you do is cumulative, and the effects that you get by manipulating each layer individually is often unforeseen. You may say, okay, I have a transparency here, or I change the effect, or the color from red to black, and so on, and you say, oh, wow, this is, 
look at what happened to all the other layers underneath it. It's interesting, or sometimes it isn't. But it's, it's, uh, I love the exploration, the fun of doing this. Uh, this is a um, patch of light. This is, let's see if I can get to this. Remember that I said I had used a little video of, uh, of a traveling shot that I, my wife and I were of a, of a vacation I was having in the south of France. And this is it here. This is Roxelle. So you can see that I've inverted this. And um, I thought I would have some effects on it. And I decided not to enable these because I, I wanted the color. Ultimately, I thought the color would be fun. If I select the top layer, of course, that's um, one of the movies that I had done uh, similar to, the, uh, to this one here and brought in and then placed in a little bit of a different place because I wanted the reflection to fit in. So ultimately, the top, the other layer was on top. The other image was on top. Composition is on top and this one on the bottom. So again, this is another iteration uh, that I thought might be interesting. Um, what happened here is that the, um, the image was too uh, predictable. I wanted something to destroy it. I wanted something to set it off. You know, maybe instead of uh, rectangular, it would be oblong, or maybe instead of um, firm, it would be soft. Maybe instead of known, it would be unknown, or it would lean towards an absurd um, expression of some kind, or um, just some unknown quality that I thought might be interesting. But in terms of this, this is what really prompted me. Maybe incongruity is really the word I'm looking for. What I wanted to do was to select just a basic solid shape, superimpose it on top of this stuff here. You can see that I've added a larger segment of the uh, oil paint background, moved the other layer that, the other composition that you had seen earlier to the right change the uh, ratio of horizontal to vertical in it from the other ones. It's more drawn out. In fact, I think this composition is 19, no, it's 2300 by 1500. So I don't pay much attention to the aspect ratios that are traditional in video. If I need something bigger than 1920, 1080, I will. Um, it just takes longer to render, but I, I think uh, it, I find that a, a more uh, a freeing from the traditional video formulaic uh, 1920, 1080, 1280, 720, which restricts me in a way that uh, I don't like. Back to or onwards to the last composition that actually became the final version of Mamonet. This is, you recognize, the, the right fragment to the triptych that I incorporated. If I deselect it, you'll see how different the, this, ver, this uh, composition looks. But um, combined with a patch of light colors here, it gave me the final version that I ultimately ended up keeping. Anyway, this concludes the short demonstration on working with After Effects project number seven. Hopefully it'll give you a rough idea of um, the process that I use to combine these various elements into a motion painting. Um, and they combine, of course, drawing uh, still images and, and movies and quick time uh, flash, an or flash animations. And um, a lot of this, I think, for me, depends on a trial and error approach to the work to see what I find interesting and not discard those that I don't find interesting and ultimately arrive at a motion painting that at least for the time being satisfies me. So thank you for watching.